145th Psalm. The 145th Psalm. I, my ears are a bit irritated and I didn't want to put my microphone on tonight, so that's why I'm up here. Uh, but the 145th Psalm is where we're going to be. Uh, I believe, if, if I am wrong, then you can text me this evening. I believe I've run out of questions for our Ask Pastor Spencer series, and so I'm not just going to make stuff up for the sake of answering. However, if for some reason, because I do want to say this, we did, I have a church cell phone and then I have a personal cell phone. Well, the church cell phone was canceled. Uh, we canceled it because it, all of y'all just texted my regular number anyway, and I got tired of lugging around two phones. And so anyway, you'll notice that my cell phone number has changed. Uh, it's my personal number. It is there on the front of the bulletin, I believe, beginning with last week's 227-1118. And so you text that. But having said that, uh, if you texted that old number and I haven't answered your question, well, I probably lost it. And so if, you, uh, if I haven't answered your question, uh, you can text me again. I'll be happy to answer uh, a question uh, that you have. Uh, but we will tonight and next Wednesday night, I want to do just a brief two-part series on the 145th Psalm. It's, uh, it's actually a Warren Wiersbe study. Some of it comes from Warren Wiersbe. Some of it's my own stuff. I like Warren Wiersbe. He's one of my favorite writers, he and Dr. Vance Havner. But the 145th Psalm, the series entitled, Let's Just Praise the Lord. Maybe you'll get encouragement here for this Wednesday night and next Wednesday night. The 145th Psalm, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10 tonight. And then we'll uh, be looking at the second half of the psalm next uh, Wednesday night. But as we begin our study tonight, let's pray together. Father, we do recognize that uh, you do still speak. However, we don't wait for a booming voice from heaven or a burning bush moment, but Father, you speak through your word. And Father, we pray that as we sit in this sanctuary this evening with hearts and minds open, that we would be receptive to what you desire to speak into our life, to speak into our hearts, that, Father, we may be encouraged, edified, but also instructed by your word. And so, Father, may you lead us into your truth. And, Father, may as we talk about praising you tonight, Father, we pray that it would be true of us, uh, that we would be Christians, we would be people filled with praise. And so, Father, bless our study tonight. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The 145th Psalm, I want you to look with me, verses 1 through 10, and we're going to go through this together. The psalmist writes, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. And I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. And his greatness, I want you to notice this word, is unsearchable. One generation shall pass your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. I'm sure you've heard the expression before, you sound like a broken record. I don't know if you've said that, if you've heard it said about you, but you know that it often means uh, someone that says something that is often repetitive, annoying, and unpleasant to the ears. Uh, if you sound like a broken record, uh, that is going to be how people think of you. Now some of us, and especially if you read scripture, some of us would think uh, that some of the Psalms are like that. They kind of seem to play the same tune repeatedly. Some of them, uh, especially the earlier ones of David, some of them sound a bit like a broken record. It, it may be a mournful dirge of sorrow and complaint. It may be a happy song of victory, but regardless, sometimes they sound a bit repetitive, but we know that also the Psalms are a mixture of trial and trust and triumph. 
Now, the writer of Psalms, many of them composed by David, some of them composed by others, but the, the writer of the Psalms, if you think of one writer or multiple writers, however you consider it, uh, the writer of each of the Psalms, uh, if, if you begin to look at Scripture, begins kind of in the earlier Psalms, in the minor key, if you will, and as he builds up to the end of the Psalms, heading towards Psalm 150, he ends really in the major key. You could say that it is a, a crescendo of praise. It starts lamenting sin and trials in the world, and it finishes by praising the Lord. Now, Psalm 145, the 145th Psalm, uh, was written with one purpose in mind. That was to praise the Lord. It's not to talk about, uh, it's not to talk about personal requests. It's not to talk about how horrible the world is. The 145th Psalm, the psalmist wrote specifically for one purpose, and that is to praise the Lord. Now, there the several psalms, if you start with 140 uh, through uh, the special section, it follows five psalms or songs of prayer. Uh, there are 140 through 144, and the 145th psalm, moving all the way to the end of the book, uh, is talking nothing but praise about the Lord. It, it, is, it is that they have seen God in His works, they've seen God in His majesty, they've seen His greatness, they've seen His goodness, and so they they write uh, in, in the beginning of this series for a psalm of praise. It is pure praise. That's why if you look at the first couple of verses, he says, I will extol or exalt thee. I'll bless your name. I'll bless you. I'll praise your name. You see, he's not satisfied in waiting until he gets to heaven to praise the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of Christians that live with the mentality, we'll have plenty of time to praise the Lord. I'm just not going to praise him right now. You and I as Christians, as born again believers, as people experiencing the greatness and the goodness of God ought to be people that are adamant, that are unapologetic, that are unequivocal in praise praising the Lord. You and I ought to be people dedicated to praise, just as the psalmist was here in these final few psalms. He praised God every day. You know, praising God is one earthly occupation that when earthly occupations are over, when earth is done, when we have expired uh, and we, have, we uh, are meeting our Savior in the air and we go to spend eternity with Him, uh, praising and singing is a job that will never go away. So if you don't like praising the Lord now, you probably aren't going to like heaven all that much. Uh, if you don't like singing right now, you probably aren't going to like heaven all that much because I can guarantee it is endless praise. That's all heaven is. There's no preaching. Hallelujah. It's only praise. And we, we look forward, we anticipate heaven because it is going to be a time of undisturbed, unceasing, uh, and unequivocal praise. Now, some Christians, if you, you look around church in a worship service, and I'm not calling anybody out, but if you look around in a worship service, you'll see some people who just love to praise the Lord, and you'll some, see some people who, to be honest, uh, judging by the look on their face, they may love the Lord, but they got a funny way of showing it. Uh, and you see, some people praise the Lord, and some people don't. Now, perhaps the difference is this, if you'll uh, simply uh, uh, entertain me for just a moment. I believe the believers who praise the Lord have their eyes of faith fixed on Him. I believe they have experienced Him in their life. They're, they have a relationship that is bonded closely with Him. They are walking with Him. They enjoy being in His presence. They enjoy spending time in His Word. And then you have the other side of people who don't praise the Lord. Uh, and the, the silent saints really only look at themselves. They look at their circumstances. They look at their life. And their eyes of faith aren't fixed on heaven. They're fixed on circumstances. And that's why they don't experience joy. They only experience happiness, which comes and it goes because it's based on the circumstances. It's based on what happens. It is circumstantial. Now, when God is the center of your life, you can praise Him every day because you will always be seeking. You'll always be finding blessings no matter how difficult your circumstances. Every one of us here is blessed. We are a blessed people. We woke up this morning, we're breathing. That, that's, that's about as much of a blessing uh, as, as you could experience today. It's an undeserved blessing, but it's a blessing nonetheless. If you have an automobile and you drove that here this evening, well, that is a blessing from God. If you have a shelter that you live in, a home, regardless of how clean or how dirty it is, or regardless of whether you got dust on the floor or you clean, regardless of what it is, uh, you are a blessed individual. Regardless of how difficult the circumstances, we are a blessed 
people. And so to the praising saint, to the praising Christian, the circumstances of life are merely a window by which we see God and we see how God works in circumstances. To a complaining saint, the same circumstances are only a mirror in which they see themselves. That's why they complain, because they're all, they've got their eyes fixed on themselves and their problems. Their eyes aren't looking, as we talked about a few Sunday nights ago, uh, tracing the rainbow through the rain. We, you can look in the storm, you can look at the storm and get discouraged and disgruntled, but you can look through the storm and find hope, uh, that our hope is in God and we recognize He is above the storm. So I want us to look at four things, but we're going to do two things tonight, and then we're going to do two things next week. But what is there about God that motivated the psalmist to praise Him? It's because he found himself caught up in four different aspects of God's person and of God's work. I want you to notice first the greatness of God. The greatness of God. Now this is a very simple study. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this psalm. But I want us to look at the whole psalm. I, number one, I want you to notice the greatness of God in Psalm 145. I want you to look at verses 3 and 6, if you will. The psalmist writes, Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. Now, if God is going to be God at all, if we recognize as Christians that God is God, regardless of how much or how little we know about God, and really every human, whether it's the, uh, whether it's the most ignorant individual on the face of the earth or whether it is the uh, most brilliant theologian, we all know, compared to what God knows, very little about God. We know very little about God, and all we know about God is what we have experienced through His Word, through spending time with Him, through what we've seen Him do in our life. That is what we know about God. That formulates uh, how we relate, how we connect to God. Now, if God is going to be God at all, God has to be great. Uh, if God can't be God and not be great. If God were God and, and were not great, then He wouldn't be much of a God worth praising. He wouldn't be much of a God worth serving. He wouldn't be much of a God worth investing our time and investing in our relationship with Him. Because if God is going to be God, God therefore must be great. Now, men, like to, men and women and boys and girls like to use the word great in reference to themselves. Talk about how great they are, how great their achievements are, how important their job is or their life is or their family is, and everything about us is just great, wonderful, gee whiz, and hallelujah. And when we speak about great, it always seems to be in reference to us and in reference to things connected with us and in reference to our circumstances. But the only thing that is really great about us is what God said was great about us. In Genesis 6, 5, he says that great is man's wickedness. That's the only thing great about you. If you come for a word of encouragement this evening, that's it. Uh, the only thing great about your life is, is you're wicked. We know that. But God has deemed us great, not because we're great people, but because He has sent His Son that we might, in Him, we might become the children, the righteousness of God only in Him. That's the only reason we're great is because of the hope uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. If you ever get to think that man's really great, you read the uh, uh, 40th chapter of Isaiah and you'll qu quickly uh, have a change of heart that mankind isn't as great. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags and all of us, all, all our iniquities are like leaves that toss us in the wind. Now, I remember George Mueller, I don't know if you know George Mueller, but one man asked George Mueller what the secret was to his service. He said, George Mueller, you've been faithful. You've served the Lord. How? What is the secret of your service to the Lord? And he very quickly responded. He said, there was a day when I died. I utterly died. Died to George Mueller. Died to his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. It's very interesting the next thing he says. He said, I died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then I have studied to show myself approved only unto God. You see, what George Mueller did in his life, as faithful as he was, as, as passionate as he was about the gospel, George Mueller knew in his life that 
of his wickedness. He knew there was nothing great about his life unless Christ lived and worked and ministered in and through the life of George Mueller. And so his life was nothing but an offering, a significant and a simple sacrifice only to God and God alone. And therefore he said, I died to myself because as Paul wrote, it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And that's the approach you and I have to take. When we are going to be obedient Christians on mission for Christ, we have to understand that we are not great people at all. There's nothing great about you, pastor. There's nothing necessarily great about our church. The only thing that makes any of us great is that God lives in us and that God desires to use us and he privileges us. Uh, that we might be used for his service and for his glory. So, a few things I want you to notice about the greatness of God. Number one, I want you to notice that God is great in his person. God's great in his person. Look at verse 3 again. He says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. And his greatness is, there's that word again, unsearchable. Everything about God in his individuality, in his person, is great and wonderful. Augustine, if you remember Augustine, some of you know who Augustine is. Everybody ought to know who Augustine is. But Augustine, in his famous works, uh, it's a compilation of works. It's the, one of the most famous pieces of literature ever composed, uh, was Augustine's Confessions. And he begins this great work of his confessions with the, with the 145th Psalm in verse 3, where he says, Great is the Lord, great is Jehovah. Augustine, as as Wonderfully devoted to the Lord as Augustine was, Augustine was totally lost in the greatness of Almighty God. You know, you can learn more about God, and, and the deeper your relationship grows with God, the greater He's going to become in your life. The reason God's not great in so many people's lives that fill our churches is because they haven't invested in a relationship with Him, never spend time with Him, don't care to know God, uh, but they want God to help them in their afflictions and their trials and their troubles, but they don't want to come to a place of praise where they're going to praise God, they're going to be obedient to God, they're going to love God, they're going to serve God, they're going to know God. Uh, they don't want any of that. They want God, uh, so they don't experience the greatness of God. And then they wonder why God doesn't answer my prayers or why, uh, why am I sick and why doesn't God seem to hear me. It's often uh, because many of us uh, don't want to come to a place of knowing him and investing in a relationship with him that he might become great to us. I don't believe really you can be a sincere, devoted, obedient servant of Christ if you are not yet captivated or simply enthralled with the simple greatness of God. Uh, God is a great individual. You know, sometimes I, I uh, prepare sermons. I, I enjoy studying. Uh, some, sometimes it gets tedious, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. I, I do love to study God's Word. I spend a lot of time uh, studying His Word throughout the week. But I'm often mesmer mesmerized not by the uh, profound work of Scripture and not by what many theologians or preachers say. I'm just overwhelmed often by the greatness of God and how He privileges us to worship Him each week. Uh, how he continually blesses us. He's a very long-suffering God. And we are to, to be totally mesmerized by the greatness of God in his person. Uh, the Bible says that his greatness, it is unsearchable. That means no one can measure, no one can fully even begin to describe or pen the words of the greatness of God. I love that old hymn, The Love of God. Uh, we, we sing that hymn, The Love of God. Everybody, I've heard it sung at uh, many funerals. Uh, if we could even begin to uh, pen the love of God, the hymn says, and I'm very much paraphrasing because I've just about forgotten it, uh, but it says, if we, uh, if we would think the ocean fill and were the sky of parchment made, uh, could try to pen the love of God, it would drain the ocean dry. I mean, there is no way you and I with words, with wisdom, uh, with uh, whimsical messages, there's no way that you and I could ever begin to comprehend, fathom, or explain uh, the love and the greatness of Almighty God. That's why Paul wrote in Romans, he knew this, in chapter 11, verse 33, Paul said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable, there's that word, are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And so God, the greatness of God is first seen in, the, is that, in that God is great in his person. But there's a second thing. Not only is God great in his person, but secondly, the Bible tells us that God is great in his works. Look at verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. 
Now, mankind has substituted God for the laws of nature or the laws of science. But you and I, as believers in Christ, in relating with Him, uh, we see the wisdom and the power of God. We see it displayed in creation. We see it throughout history. I mean, if you think about the Bible, uh, you think about the children of Israel, uh, God's greatness was certainly displayed all throughout their life. I mean, if you look all the way throughout the Old Testament, I jotted a few down in my study, you'll really see the greatness of God throughout Israel's history, throughout America's history. Uh, th throughout history, we see the greatness and the favor of God. You think about in Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. And oh, how God has used Abraham, uh, the father of many nations. He'll have many descendants, more numerous than the stars. Oh, Father Abraham. And God certainly called him and knew what he was doing. And the favor of God was not only on Abraham, the favor of God is still on all of his descendants. There was also the birth of Isaac in Genesis chapter 21. Uh, we knew that God was certainly working in those circumstances in Israel's history, but also in Christian history. Uh, and we know that God was certainly had his hand of favor upon them, although they kind of went off the rails and Ishmael happened and there was a lot of stuff take place with Abraham and Sarah and they got out of the will of God a little bit. God was still faithful and God was still great and he was great in using and employing Isaac. If you think about Exodus, you go to the book of Exodus in chapter 12 through 15, uh, you'll, you'll see the great Exodus, how God was faithful to lead his children, the children of Israel, his people, out of Egyptian bondage there in Egypt. If you think about Numbers chapter 10 through 15, you see how God was faithful to the Israelites and the wonders all throughout the wilderness. If you think about, uh, if you think about Joshua, the whole book of Joshua, you see about the crossing of the Jordan, the conquest of the land that was promised to them. You see about the great mighty walls of Jericho. God's greatness was certainly throughout their history. Uh, if you think about the, if you think all throughout Israel's history, the mighty acts of God in delivering His people and establishing His kingdom. But I want you to notice something very interesting about that. If you think now, you're talking about the span of tens to hundreds of years in between all of these events. Well, God was certainly faithful because you know why? Each generation was telling about God's wonderful acts, about His works, about His deeds, about all that God had done in their life. Now, it, it amazes me how often Israel forgot that. Uh, Israel would tell it, they proclaim God is great, God is wonderful, and somehow they would still get back into the point where they started from. They would still find some way to be unfaithful or disobedient, but God was always great and faithful to them. And that's why the fourth verse there in the 145th Psalm talks about the each generation telling of the greatness of of God's works. The greatness of God is seen not only in His, in his person, not only in His works, but thirdly, it's seen, at, and perhaps my favorite point of God's greatness, and that is that the greatness of God is seen in His majesty. Look at verse 5, if you will. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Now, the word majesty is very simply defined to mean that for which a person is admired or celebrated. Now, the word, of glo the word glory is a good equivalent to majesty. They're often used interchangeably. They often mean the same thing when they're referring to Jehovah God. They're always talking about God's glory, His majesty, or even the word splendor. Now, the glory of God is the sum total of all that God is, all that God does. And glory, it's not a separate or a specific attribute of of God because all that God is and does is glorious and majestic. God is glorious in His holiness, in His work, in His wisdom, and in His name. God, everything about God is majestic. He is glorious. It reminds me of the story, uh, well, it's not a story, it's true, in 1715, the year 1715, none of you were alive then, some of you may have been, but none of you were alive then. In the year 1715, uh, King Louis the Fourteenth of France he died after a reign of 72 years. He reigned the average life expectancy of Americans. I mean, it's incredible how long King Louis the Fourteenth reigned. He was called often King Louis the Great. He was, or sometimes people just call him the Great. Uh, he was a monarch and who made the famous statement. He said, "I am the state." I am France, I am everything. His court was the most magnificent in Europe. It was indeed well respected. He indeed had uh, much grounding there. People respected France during his reign. His funeral 
was especially spectacular. They had pulled out all the stops when he died uh, for his funeral to make it majestic and full of splendor. His body laid in state in a gold coffin. It was totally made through and through solid gold. Orders were given that the cathedral they were having the funeral in had to be specifically and specially dimly uh, lit so that only a special candle that was set above the gold coffin uh, would glimmer. That, that would be the light. It, it would symbolize or signify his greatness in his history to France. Well, at the memorial, thousands waited in hushed silence, packed out place, and the minister was then Bishop Massillon. Bishop Massillon, what he did is he began to speak, and as he was speaking and giving the eulogy, he slowly reached down to the candle that lay upon his coffin, gold-encrusted coffin, the king of France's funeral. He slowly snuffed the candle out, and he said four words. Now, this is bold. I, I couldn't do this. He said, only God is great. We're talking about King Louis XIV. He was called the Great. He was the greatest, most powerful person in France and in that time in the world. And yet, Bishop Massillon said, only God is great. You and I recognize that regardless of how majestic we may be. Now, none of us are kings or ruling a great, a great country or a piece of land. But regardless of how majestic people are, doesn't matter whether you're president of the United States uh, king of Britain or whether you're king of France or whether you're the lowest servant on the totem pole. It doesn't matter. None of us are great. None of us are majestic. Only God in his majesty and in his splendor is great. Now the word translated speak, if you look there in verse 5, it can also mean meditate. Some of your Bibles say that. Mine does. Or dwell on. Have you, have you ever taken time to meditate on the glory of God? I wonder how many of us really uh, specifically take time to think, to meditate, to, to really dwell on the wonderful glory of God. The glory of man is not worth dwelling on. Your achievements are, are going to burn out. They're gonna, they won't last. You'll be discouraged in a couple of days. You get on a high moment, you do something great. Well, that's going to fizzle out because next tomorrow comes, next week comes, and something gets in the way. But the glory of God is a wonderful theme. It is a wonderful thing to meditate, to dwell on, to certainly be people that we would speak, that we would dwell on the glory of God. One final thing, then we'll move on from the greatness of God. Uh, I want you to notice uh, that God is great not only in His majesty, not only in His works, not only in His person, but fourthly, God is great in his judgment. Uh, God is totally magnificent in his judgment. Uh, if there's one subject absent from the pulpits of America today, it's the judgment of God. Nobody talks about the judgment of God anymore. Talk about the love of God, and the grace of God, and the peace of God. Nobody talks about the judgment of God. God is great not only in his love, not only in his peace, not only in his person, not only in his majesty, not only in his works. God is great in his judgment. God never ceases to be great. God never ceases to be holy. Because look at verse 6. He said, men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts. I will tell of your greatness. Now that word awesome there, my New American Standard says awesome. Some of you, your translations, uh, they're going to say right there, going to say terrible. It, it's kind of weird sometimes the word terrible and the word awesome is used interchangeably. Now in our modern vernacular, uh, they often mean two different things. But in the Greek, sometimes they do often mean the same things in certain contexts. But that word terrible means awe-inspiring, awesome, awe-inspiring. It, it really initiates in our life a sense of awe. And it's talking about his mighty acts of judgment. Now, in order to deliver God's people, uh, God had to judge their enemies. If you think about Passover, Passover meant redemption for Israel. Boy, they celebrated Passover's coming. It means redemption for Israel. It also meant judgment to Egypt. It was condemnation. It was not going to be good for the country of Egypt because it was going to ruin Egypt. Now, some people so emphasize, and this is the problem, people like to emphasize that God is either all-loving or God is either all judging. They try to have one side of the coin or the other. You go to some really, I mean, and 
Uh, I, I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God, but you go some and they'll beat their fists and bang around on the pulpit and say, oh, y'all going to go to hell and all this stuff. And I, you know if you've heard me preach for a long time, I, I don't do that. Now, I do preach the reality of hell, uh, but I'm not going to tell you you're going to go to hell. Now, you do uh, if, if you're uh, living in unrepentant, unconfessed sin and you haven't uh, made a decision to follow Christ and to trust in Him as your Savior. I can tell you where your final destination is going to be. Uh, but we often understand that there also is the love and the grace of God that provides us the hope of salvation and we also need to understand that although God is a righteous judge God is also uh, a loving God and we recognize that it's not that God is all loving it's not that God is all judging but that God is both and that God is holy that God is righteous that God is just to do as he wishes as he wills for our good and for his glory we understand that God is both, that God can't be separated, He can't be divided, but that God is one and He works as He desires. And we understand that because we trust in the greatness of God. I'll, I'll, I'll get on this tangent and then we'll get back on, on the road and keep traveling down the road. Uh, but, I, you know, people talk about the, the judgment or the love of God. We don't need to so emphasize the judgment or the love of God as we need to the holiness of God. I can tell you the last time I heard a sermon on the holiness of God, I believe it was three years ago. Uh, that, that's a subject that we I never knew was mentioned. I never, didn't even know what it was until I got into the ministry. Uh, but the holiness of God is something that God is always holy. And if God were going to overlook sin, as so many people want to say you know, about their churches and say, well, God is all love and we're going to embrace everything, uh, we, ought to love, we ought to love the sinner but hate the sin. And God cannot overlook sin. God cannot be permissible to sin because God cease to be holy. God would cease to be righteous. But we know that God has taken all sin. He put on His Son. He took His Son to the cross. His Son died to be the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. And the hope we have in the gospel is that God loved us enough to send His Son to be in our place. But all we have to do is come by that free and gracious invitation. Uh, it's free to us. It cost Him something. Uh, it cost Jesus His life. And we come by way of the cross. And that is our hope. And it is through the cross that we strive to live in the holiness of God. That we want to be people that are sanctified, we're set apart, we're justified, means we're saved. One day we're going to be glorified, but until then, we want to be sanctified people. We want to uh, continually try to seek the holiness of God, to live in holiness, to walk in holiness, to pursue righteousness in all things. So God is great in His judgments. Now, because the children of Israel were so special to God, you know, they were, uh, they were God's children, they were God's chosen people, he defended them, he fought for them, but he also judged and, and chastised Israel. Uh, there were many times, if you read throughout the scripture, as much as God loved the nation of Israel, God judged them, God punished them, God gave them uh, discipline. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I'd, I'd often get a spanking or something, and uh, I'd say, uh, uh, and mother would always say, I'm doing this because I love you. Her dad would say, I'm doing this because I love you. That never made sense at the time. Uh, but it does make sense now. We, we discipline because we love. We discipline because we want them to walk in obedience. And sometimes God is going to chastise or discipline us. And we might be people to pursue His holiness, His righteousness, but also to pursue obedience to Him. You know, there's fear of the Lord there. The Bible says, I'll, I'll proclaim the, the fear of the Lord. I'll tell others of the fear of the Lord. And that, that recognizes that God, He is the judge of sin and too often we don't worship that enough. We, our worship's shallow, it's sentimental, it's, it's not necessarily worshipful because it, it, it's superficial. You know, some people, they confess their sins and it's superficial. They don't mean it. They confess it and they go right back to doing it again. Confession's not enough. It's got to be confession, repentance, a change of life, a change of heart, that we would pursue Him in obedience. So the question when considering the greatness of God, you know, the psalmist had a, a great admiration, a great appreciation for the greatness of God. Uh, but the question is, how do you and I grow in our appreciation of the greatness of God? And that's very simple. Uh, is, and that is that we grow in the greatness of God by the appreciation, uh, and, and in appreciation by studying His Word, by there, as George Mueller said, by showing ourselves approved unto God, by seeing Him at work in our world. But the psalmist, of, of, the psalmist said that the greatness of God in a storm, as well as in the history of His people, that God is always Great, And we understand that the greatness of God is only experience as we know God and experience God and invest in our relationship with God that we might know Him. I've got some good news for you. 
I got one point in. I've got another point. We'll pick that up next week. So we'll we'll stretch this out into a few weeks. But I don't want to keep you longer. I know many of you you want to watch the debate this evening. We certainly need to be praying for that. But I want you to take your prayer list out tonight. And as you're doing that, are there any questions about the greatness of God as we discussed tonight? Any questions about the greatness of God? All right. Be looking at your.